Oh, Shulk, look over there.
We are starting in under two minutes. I hope you are having a beautiful day so far. by Page Wizard Games Learning and Entertainment. It's that time, everybody. Time for more entertainment and fun with your favorite computer scientist, Dr. Daniel Page. Welcome to Dan Plays, where Dan has fun with friends and we talk about all sorts of fun things, including computer science and everything under the sun. No barriers, just fun. Check out all the fun rewards and supporter access at the links. That's enough for now. Let's get started. Come on, Dan. Let's get started. Hello everybody! I hope everyone's having a beautiful day so far and I'll welcome you onto the stream here today for today's lecture. So, if it's your first time here, my name is Dan. For formals, it's, uh, it's Dr. Page, but just call me Dan or Daniel. I hope you're having a beautiful day so far. So, before we get started for today, uh, so just before anything, uh, I should mention the main subject for today is going to be on the equivalence of DFAs and NFAs. So, we've talked previously about some uh, finite state automata before. We talked about this idea of determinism versus non-determinism. We've seen lots and lots of examples, but, but that's okay. If you haven't seen that before, we're still going to be talking about these kind of ideas before we really get into everything here today. So if say you missed it, the last couple of lectures, that's okay. That's okay. You just need some primer for what we're talking about here today, which I'm going to be doing a little bit of discussion about that before we get started. But before we do that, before we do that, if you enjoy what you're seeing so far, make sure you subscribe, follow, tell your friends to come join the fun, and join the fun learning computer science, having all sorts of fun with us here at Page Wizard Games Learning and Entertainment here with Dr. Page. We, we, have ourselves a blast, okay? That's, that's what I would uh, definitely say. I know I'm having a blast, so I hope that resonates through the camera. I know there isn't a whole lot of this out there, so I'm hoping people will appreciate having these affordable options for learning computer science, especially at this level, because I must stress that uh, if you talk about high quality computer science educational content, there's very few limited options if you want to get this level. Uh, usually, you, uh, or at least there are good options out there, but not as many as I would hope. <laughs> That's the best way I could describe it to you. So essentially, you want to find a nice authoritative educational resource, you're at the right place. You're at the right place. Um, before that, before we get into things, I got to mention one other thing. I am currently trying to evaluate the live schedule, and I want to know about your availability for these live lectures and also our entertainment shows that we do on a weekly basis. So please check out our social media pages that tell us a little bit about uh, your availability. So if you're watching this say on 
on say YouTube or you look at the social media pages we have. Actually, I'll just put that on the screen here. Uh, just get the carousel of URLs going. Uh, so if you find yourself wanting to look up uh, how you can help give us that information, we have a form going that's been posted on so our social media. So check that out. It only takes two, like at most maybe two minutes to fill out. I just want to know about your availability so that I can calibrate our live's programming so that you can come and join the fun. If say, for example, you're watching this in the future and say you want to participate in the stream too. So that being said, uh, the chat is open. Uh, be aware that uh, I'm not going to worry so much if you're going to have yourselves a blast in the chat. Have a blast in the chat. If you want to ask questions, I'm happy to hear those questions. I got a visual monitor in front of me right here, and I also got my earpiece. So just be aware that if you put things in the chat, I will see them. And if you make fun jokes, they <laughs> consider it a fun challenge, as a friend of mine would say. See if, uh, see if we could have some fun, uh, ourselves some fun here. So please, if you're joining us here live, um, come join in the chat. Interact with me. Uh, uh, ask questions. If there's other people in the chat you want to hang out with, it's encouraged, okay? Other than that, uh, one other thing I need to point out is, uh, is that if the chat is visible on the screen, the text-to-speech and any audio cues that come from the chat, whether it be, over, specifically it's over Twitch, um, if you hear any of those things, it'll be only when the chat is visible on the screen, but be aware that I could still see the chat and hear the chat when the, the chat isn't visible anymore. I just want to mention that for those that maybe take advantage or would like to use those audible options or use those audible options as cues, okay? So just just because the chat isn't visible doesn't mean I don't see it, okay? Just that's the big point I'm getting at. If you have a question, I'll try my best to answer it on the spot. If it looks like a little bit more of a complicated question, or maybe you wanna ask for another example or anything like that, uh, just put it in the chat. I may have to hold off until we get to about kind of like a nice intermission point, so that way I can address it more carefully. Uh, but other than that, that's pretty much everything I had to say. Um, one thing I'm really excited about is that our programming now for our videos is now up to the rest of this week. So I do have the schedule for all of this set up already. If you go to, I believe, pagewizardgames.com slash schedule, you can actually see what all of the events and all of the lectures, what they're going to be for the rest of the month. So that includes some things we're going to talk about here, which I'm really excited about. <laughs> So, anyways, everybody, I'm just going to, actually, I'll just leave the chat open just for now, because we're going to, like I said, I was going to do a little bit of primer just to remind us about everything here. But uh, a couple quick things before we get into today's lesson. So, uh, we've been focusing in on finite state automata. Now, in a finite state automata, or automatons, the same thing. If I give you one of them, an automaton, uh, here's the thing. These have states that they could be in. They can, they behave accordingly to reading input symbols. So you can think of this like a one-way reading machine that reads one symbol at a time. And what it does is it transitions upon reading one of the symbols. So you can think of it like the me over here as this this set of symbols are coming out and I just gobble down one at a time. Just ah, 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 ah. I gobble each one, one at a time. And until the entire string is gone, the input, then the machine will cease once the input is read. If not, what it does is it transitions from one state potentially to another state using what is called the transition function, which is going to be probably one of the most important aspects of today's lesson. So. The machine begins in an initial state and it has a set of final states. So upon reading the input from when it starts off in the start state, it may transition to several other states. But the point is, at, by the time I'm done reading the input, I'm going to be, if I'm in one of the, sorry, if my machine, so I'm getting really excited here. If my machine is in one of these final or accepting states, the machine will declare that it is accepting the string. It will declare and say, I accept the input string. Otherwise, if, it is, if it's in a state that is not one of the accepting or final states, it will reject. It will reject the string. 
So the language for which the machine recognizes a language, which is a set of strings, is the ones for which the input always gets accepted. So one thing we talked about last time was this idea of non-determinism. So what is determinism? So in the context of finite automata, uh, what we need to think about this as is, you know when I said that you read the input and then you transition, right? Deterministic means there exists a deterministic path of execution, meaning that, that when you go from one state to another state, it's only one state. So if I read a symbol in a given state, it tells me which state I need to go to next. There is, there is no way I'm allowed to be in multiple states at the exact same time, which is what non-determinism is all about. So determinism means I give you state, input symbol, tells me which state I'm going to next. There is a predefined, explicitly one state that it could be in upon transitioning. This is in contrast to non-determinism for which you can transition into multiple states at the same time. And I must stress that the way non-determinism operates can be thought of as perfect guessing. So what happens is you can imagine the machine selects a state to be in among those possible states. It selects one such that if there exists a path of execution such that it gets to a state which is a final or accepting state, it will in fact select such a sequence of states. So it's allowed to pick sets of states. So we talked actually about two different intuitions. One is for which it does this, which we described it as magical, right? Because it's clairvoyance. <laughs> it doesn't, it can't know the future. But the thing is, this machine is capable of doing that. It can select, it can select states such that if there exists an accepting state that for which the transitions may reach upon reading the input, it will do this. If there exists no such path, then it will just pick any one of the, the subsets of states along each possible selection. And it'll just simply say, yeah, that was a bad guess. And it, it just makes a bad guess. <laughs> In contrast, we could also think about it as like a parallel machine for which it has massively spawned parallel threads for which whenever there's a possibility of choosing a set of states, it'll just spawns threads of execution literally upon each transition. Now, we already talked about how this isn't quite, it's a little bit more realistic than the clairvoyant approach, but you must, it must stress that this idea, at least within the context of finite automata, while possible, it is going to be quite an expensive thing to do, right? Because one, there could be many, many threads that get spawned. Um, at the same time, keep in mind, there could be as many as you like up to some number of states, right? Uh, but at the same time, it's at least something that you could imagine, you could imagine a, a, a computer like a laptop or something doing if it had that many processing elements, if it was capable of doing that. But the point I'm getting at is that we had a couple different intuitions for non-determinism, but here's the main thing we're going to talk about here today is can we simulate non-determinism in the context of finite automata? And we're going to see quite interestingly that the answer is going to be yes. And it's going, the intuition is really nice because it will remind you of the second intuition if you're familiar with, with this idea of exhausting or brute forcing all possible options, akin to what we described last time. But I'll show you a better way of doing it after. <laughs> that, that will remind you a little bit more of something, something along the lines that is an intuition that first is helpful, but it also generalizes in other contexts. But anyways, today we're gonna be talking about the relationship between DFAs and NFAs, namely that, uh, let, well, let me, let me uh, ask a question. I think this is a great place for us to start. It's usually posing an appropriate question, a question that, roots out an insight for us, or at least drives our discussion forward, will be good. And in fact, this will remind you of a, of a question that I've asked you previously, is, so are NFA, so these are non-deterministic finite automatons, 
Are NFAs or automata? Are NFAs capable capable of recognizing more than regular languages? Interesting question, right? Well, for a couple of reasons. The first one is that I haven't, we, all the things we've seen so far, they sound like something conceivable that maybe I could do with a DFA. It's not quite clear at this stage what it means for a language to not be regular really at all. We haven't discussed that idea at all. But there's a much more conceptual but interesting thing really going on here. When I say that uh, our NFA is capable of recognizing more than regular languages, there's another way of me putting this question. So imagine I give you a DFA. So a DFA saves DFA D. We would agree that it has a language, right? Namely the strings for which the DFA accepts on those strings. We would denote this as L of D, right? Likewise, if I have an NFA, say we'll call it N, we would say all oh, the language of NFA N is the set of strings for which the NFA accepts, right? And we talked about the differences between these two things previously, correct? Now, what would it mean in two different scenarios? What would this question really mean if I said yes or no? Um, well, if I said yes, that means that there exists some NFA N such that when I look at the language here, it has to be that the language itself for some NFA, it has to be one such that I cannot come up and derive a DFA such that L of D isn't equal to L of N. So there has to be some some uh, some NFA that is capable of this, right? It has to exist as long as there's at least one, then the answer would be yes, right? Because by definition, we said that any DFA, um, if I look at the language it recognizes, we said that that is a regular language, right? To say that the answer is yes to this, that would mean that there exists one NFA that does not have the same property, it means it does not it means that that language has to have the property that there is no DFA. Now, if I said no, if I said no, if I answered this no, what would that mean? What would that mean? Well, it could take, be taken a couple different ways. Well, first, we've really seen the versatility of NFAs, right? We already know that every NFA is like a generalization of a DFA, correct? So to posit this saying that it would recognize less than the regular languages would seem very strange, right? Because I already told you that non-determinism generalizes over determinism, correct? So to suggest that it would recognize less than the regular languages would be very surprising and strange, right? So if I said no, then perhaps, perhaps a, an interesting idea would be if I were to give you an NFA, that there may exist an equivalent DFA in the sense that its language is in fact the same language over here. And that's what we're going to explore here today, is we're going to be seeing how when I give you an NFA, I can actually build a DFA that has the exact same language. Namely, surprisingly, surprisingly, surprisingly the answer is actually no. And in fact, it is the case that all languages NFAs recognize are regular. <laughs> so So what we're going to do is we're going to be exploring this, namely, we're going to be exploring how 
NFAs and DFAs are in fact equivalent. Meaning that if I give you an NFA, there's going to exist a DFA for which the languages that they actually recognize are going to be in fact be equal. And the other way around. So that's going to be the topic for today's lecture. Hopefully everyone understands the main idea here. So I'm going to show you that actually giving non-deterministic uh, non behavior to a finite automaton, you know, even, even if you want to think about it the most wildest ways you can, in the setup that we have, it doesn't actually add any more computing power. So here we go, here we go. Now, you might ask, Dan, how are we going to do this? I'm going to introduce a couple different pieces that are going to get us there, to get to the claim that this is in fact true. So there's going to be a bit, bunch of bits and pieces. And to, that's what we're going to be doing today, is we're going to be building up to the theorem that is going to tell us that this is going to be the case. So at the heart of proving the claim, this one, is actually a procedure. It's a rather important procedure. So let me write something down about this. At the heart, at the heart of proving this claim is the subset construction. So some people call this the power set construction. You'll see why either one is pretty common. So some people call this power set construction instead. But I'll just refer to it as the subset construction. So what before I attempt to prove this equivalency between DFAs and NFAs, I'm going to show you what the subset construction is. We're going to see an example. And then I'm going to show you how we can specialize the, this subset construction so that we do it a little bit smarter than just what you're going to first see. So check this out. I'm going to describe this procedure to you. So this is something you can implement. So to be clear what we're doing, going to be doing here is I'm going to take an NFA, N, and I'm going to show you how to build a DFA such that this holds. Now I'm not going to prove the last part here. I'm going to first show you how to do this construction so that you take the NFA, make a DFA, and then we're going to prove that this is indeed the case. So here we go. So given NFA, N, and I'm going to use some notation that's a little different than what we did previously, just to indicate that it's the NFA versus the DFA. Okay, everybody? So check this out. So we're going to have Q sub N sigma delta N Q zero and F N. <laughs> I have to be very careful when I pronounce that, okay? <laughs> uh, we describe slash construct a DFA D, which is going to have a set of states QD, sigma. So notice that the sigma is going to be the same as this one. It's going to have a transition function QD. It's going to have an initial state, and I'm going to make a note about this in a moment, that's going to be Q0 with curly braces around it. So that's going to indicate a subset. But I'll get to that in a moment, OK? And then we have FD. Now, where L of n is equal to L of d. So just a couple quick things before we get into this. First thing, I'm using these n's to indicate and use parts of the NFA. The d's are to help us distinguish between the two. n's for NFA, d's for DFA, okay? Is that clear, everybody? So 
Remember, the definition of the transition function is different between n and d. So notice qn, this is the definition of a transition function for a NFA, right? This is the transition function for a DFA. This is going to play a very important role here. So please make sure don't forget about that. And this marker is giving me some fun time. It's gone. It's gone. Boo! <laughs> uh, say. So let's, uh, let's describe the subset construction. So DFA D is constructed as follows. So, so naturally, I'm going to have to describe to you what the states are, what all of these are. So a second thing that we're, is going to be fairly important here is that you'll notice right here that this right here is describing a subset of the states, right? So notice here's Q0, then this is Q0 with curly braces around it. What's going to happen in this construction, and we're going to see this, and it'll come very apparent when we do the example, that we're going to be having it where we're going to be building subsets of the original set of states. But the thing is, is that they're going to be treated like labels. So, you know, like just for example, you'd agree with me that this is the number five, right? But you would agree with me as well that this is a number five on a card, right? So it's on a card. So be aware of the context that is being used here. First, it is indeed a subset of the set of states of n, right? But it's also going to be a label for a state. So states, or potentially some subset of states, that's like reading the five versus treating it like a state, which is like having a card here. So just don't let that throw you off, okay? So you'll see what I mean, because remember, the DFA transitions into exactly one state. It'll look a little bit weird if you don't remember this, that we're going to be constructing labels for states based on the subsets. And of course, you could re always relabel these to give them names that are a little bit easier to follow. So first, we've got to talk about the states of DFA D. So first, QD. QD is the power set of QN. So for those, just as a reminder, power set simply means all the subsets of QN. So a question, how many states can there be then for this DFA? <laughs> so we've actually talked about this previously when we talked about counting in the past. But how many subsets are there of a given set with n elements in it? So I'll let you think about it. If there are n states, there are how many? How many? Well, I'll give you a bit of a tip. Okay, for any one subset, so any one subset I determine from a set of n elements, I have the choice of either including it in the subset or not including in the subset. So there's two choices, right? But I do this for n elements. So that means that how many can there be? Well, there's exactly two to the power of n of them. So there's an exponential number of states in this DFA. So just as a remark, so that, that is a lot of states, just be very clear. <laughs> that's, that's an exponential number. It means that this, there's going to be a little bit of a blow up in the process of this. So just as a remark, so any states not, re uh, not reachable,
not reachable from the start state. can be discarded. Now, let me explain what that means. So, if you look at your transition diagram for a DFA, we agree that the machine starts in Q0, namely, well, our DFA was this one. It would start in this subset's label, right? But likewise, we said that it starts in a start state. You process symbols, right? But there's going to be some states that no matter which string you give it, it will never actually reach one of those states, meaning it will never transition into that state at any point, period, regardless of what the string is. These are what we refer to as states that are not reachable from the start state. And hence, you can get rid of them. They're, they're just sort of redundant. They're just sitting there doing nothing. So you could, you could freely remove these from this construction. I'll show you after this a way of doing this without having to do it manually, meaning that I'll show you how you can modify the subset construction procedure such that you never have to worry about these non-reachable or unreachable states. So next we got, I'm gonna talk about the final states. So just keep in mind that we have that five tuple over there. So far we talked about what QD is, but now I have to talk about each one of them, right? With the exception of the ones that are the same, like the input symbols don't change, right? And I've explicitly told you what the start state would be, right? But so that means that I have how many other things to tell you about? The final states and also the transitions, right? So those are the only two I haven't really told you about yet. So. So FD is all subsets of the states of N of N of N that include at least one one final state of n. So just be a bit more precise in my language, more exactly. Fd is the set, the set of sets, S, which are a subset of the set of states Qn, so that S, so if I take the elements and I check them against Fn, it has to be that there's at least one element in common. So remember, in the DFA, these subsets are going to be labels for states. So lastly, we got the transitions. We got our transitions. Oh, I forgot some lights here. Let's get some lights here. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Hopefully that looks a little bit nicer. <laughs> so now finally we have the transitions. For each subset, so remember, We have each of these subsets of the set of states of n, and each and each input symbol, each symbol a among the set of input symbols. We're going to do the following. So I'll, I'm going to write it out fancy first, and then I will give you the plain language version of what I'm just saying to do. So watch this carefully. So delta D, so remember this is the transition function for the DFA D. We're saying that for that subset, remember this is a label in the context of the DFA. 
S on A. We're going to go through all of the states in S, and we're going to apply the transition function of the NFA for P on symbol A. That looks a little bit scary looking at first, but here's all I'm saying to do. So look at all the states. So just, all I'm saying is look at all the states. P in S, I have to enunciate that very carefully. <laughs> and union, <laughs> and union together, union together, all, all the states, N, it goes to, from P on symbol A. So what I'm saying is you go through all of those states, so you'll have some subset of states. You're gonna look at each one of them, and you'll look at the transition function for that. You're just gonna take each one of them. So you look at those states in S, and you take and lump all together the states that you get as a result of applying the transition function on P with symbol A. So this will become very clear what this is about when we see the example. So don't let this look a little spooky. That's all I'm saying to do. And remember, when you're done this process, when you figure this out, this is just another label. Because remember, it's a transition function for a DFA, right? A DFA, not an NFA. However, it uses the transition function of the NFA to figure out what label you'd use. So that's how we're going to describe the subset construction. I think it'd be a good idea we see an example. So let's walk through the process of the subset construction now. So we're going to revisit it, a NFA from one of our previous lessons. So I'm going to draw its transition diagram. So I'm going to have three states, Q0, Q1, and Q2. The start state is going to be Q0, whenever it reads a 0 or a 1, it stays in Q0 regardless. Upon reading a 1, it goes into Q1. And then finally, in upon reading a 0, it goes into Q2, where Q2 is going to be a final state. So that's going to be the only final state. So let's walk through the process of applying the subset construction. So remember, this is our this is our NFA here. So remember, this is an NFA. The goal with the subset construction is to build a DFA that accepts the same language, meaning it recognizes the same one. Meaning that, just to clarify even further, if I give you any input string, when this guy accepts the string, it will be that this DFA will also accept the very same set of strings. So let's walk through this process. It's easier, I would argue, to do and carry out the subset construction using a transition table. So I'm going to visualize it like this. However, you're welcome if you have an intuition for it on a transition diagram. Go for that. It's, it's fine. But I personally think that it's easier to play around with this using a transition table. In fact, it's much easier to describe it that way as well. At least that's my view about it. So anyways. What I'm going to do is go through the same process of building a transition table for a DFA. So remember the goal here is I'm going to take this NFA, I'm going to create a DFA. So this is going to be the transition table for the DFA. Is that clear everybody? So that means I'm going to first follow through the steps. So the first thing I told you is that this DFA is going to have 
for every one of the subsets of the set of states for my NFA, I'm going to have a state. So here we go. So I'm going to have the empty set, which is, that's indeed a subset. We're going to have Q0. I must stress, remember, we talked about this being the start state. So I'm just going to indicate that it's the start state already. Don't need to do a whole lot beyond that. We're going to have Q1. Q2. So I'm just going through all the subsets with one element in them. Well, one state, be a bit more precise. Q0, Q1. And then we'll have Q0, Q2. And then we're going to have Q1, Q2. And then we're going to have the last one, just Q0, Q1, Q2. So it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I have eight states for my DFA, which is exactly what you'd expect to happen, right? Because there's three states. So two to the power of three, eight. So what else can I label in this without needing to do a whole lot of work? So I have the start state already indicated. Well, I can indicate the input symbols, right? They're the exact same ones I had for this one, just zero and one. What else? What else do I already know before I have to fill in these entries here? There's something I could tell really quickly as well. I know which of these states should be a final or accepting state, right? What did we say a final or accepting state is? It's any subset here that contains a final state of the NFA. Notice that any one that has Q2 in it, because Q2 is a final state, that is also a final state over here. So Q2, the subset with just Q2 in it is, this one with Q0 and Q2, um, and also we have Q1, Q2, and then we have this one with all the, that was a weird asterisk, let me fix that. There we go. So all of the ones I've just starred there, all of these are also final states, all four of those. Why? Because they contain Q2, which is a final state of the NFA, right? So now that leaves us with the part I would argue takes the most time to do with the subset construction. It is building up all of our transitions here. So just remember, just like I said explaining this before, Remember, these over here, this column of subsets, indeed, these are all the subsets of the states of the NFA, right? So they're just like my number five, right? However, in the DFA, in the context for which they're being used, they're actually just like this card, just a label with a number five, just like a, it, it could be a subset, but indeed is in fact just a label that is a subset. I can always relabel these after if I wanted to. So just as long as you remember that, you'll notice very quickly that I'm going to start putting subsets in here as opposed to just a single state. Uh, in the context of how we would normally do this, th what I'm going to have here are going to be subsets, but these are actually labels for states. So please remember that. So I'm just gonna make that for here. Remember. Remember. Um, I'll say, I'm just thinking of a nice way of putting this. The sets in the transition table, in the transition table, are labels. The set of states the set of states Q D is indeed a set though, right? So remember, these are just labels. They all just label states, but that means it's still a set of states, even though the notation here makes it look like it's just like a set of sets. So I'm just going to say we can relabel the states. 
So if you wanted to call these states like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and so on, you're welcome to do that. It doesn't change anything about this. However, it becomes a little bit trickier to understand how you're supposed to compute the transition function. So that's why I'm doing it like this. Normally you would go through this process as so, and you could relabel all of the states when you're done. So let's start off with this. So remember, let's go back to our definition over here of the transition. So it's important for us to see what the game plan is. So for every one of these rows, I'm going to have to look at when I read a zero and when I read a one. So remember over here, what our definition is for the transition of our DFA. So for any one of those subsets, which remember that's each row. So that's what I mean by subset, it's a row of our table. When I read an input symbol, this is one of the columns. What I'm saying is you look at each one of the states that would be in that subset, you read off what the transition function for the interface says, to what states is it going to be transitioning into, maybe multiple states, and you're gonna do this over all of, the, all of the states in there. And whatever you end up with will be a label of a state that, for which you'll transition to the state over in the appropriate row. So let's start off here. So notice very quickly that if I look at the subset empty set, what does the definition say? For each state in the empty set, I'm supposed to apply this transition function. However, you'll notice very quickly that there aren't any states in that subset, right? So, so these would just be transitioning to the exact same state. Nothing too terribly interesting. How about for Q0? So remember, I look at this subset. It says Q0, so it means I'm going to look at Q0 when I read a 0. When I read a 0, what set of states do I end up with? Just Q0, right? So, so I just have Q0. When I read a 1, however, notice if I look at Q0, I follow with my finger. Okay, 1 stays in Q0. I have another transition with a 1. It goes to Q1, so I have Q0... Q1, right? So I have Q0, Q1 over here, and Q0 right there. Notice that they're subsets, but remember, these are labels that match up with these ones, right? Because they're all states. So these are just labels. So now I have Q1 next. So when I'm in Q1, so remember, it's just one state here. Q1, I read a zero. I go to Q2, right? That's the only state it goes to for the NFA. However, on reading a 1, notice there's no other transitions here. It would go, in fact, transition over to the state that is labeled by the subset empty set. <laughs> so, <laughs> so next, let's look at the next row, Q2. Upon reading a 0 or 1, it, there are none, right? So these are all transitioned to that state corresponding to the empty set. Now, let's proceed to the next row. Q0, Q1. Now, now we're looking at some more interesting ones because now we have it where there's more than one state. So let's apply the definition more carefully. Okay. Q0. So I have Q0, Q1. So I'm going to look at Q0 on a 0. That's Q0, right? So, so for the first case, when I look at Q0, it stays in Q0, correct? And then I'm supposed to perform a union with whatever it would be for Q1. So Q1, when I read a 0, it's Q2, right? So notice that I've just looked at each one of these and I see what set of states it sends me to on that input symbol. So the result of this is just Q0, Q2, right? Let's do another one. Let's read a 1. Say Q0 on a 1, it goes Q0, Q1. So both has Q0, Q1. Okay, how about uh, Q1 on a 1? There's no transition out on a 1. So this is just union with the empty set, right? So that means that we're just gonna end up with Q0, Q1. Now, let's look at Q0, Q2. So let's go through the same process again. 
So we got Q0, Q2, like a Q0 on a zero. Stays in Q0, right? So you know that's definitely in here. Q2, when I read a zero, there's nothing, right? So it's just Q0. That's it. It's the subset with Q0 in it. And then we have on a one, Q0 is Q0, Q1. And for Q2, it will be nothing, right? So we're going to end up again with Q0, Q1. Hopefully you're understanding the process now. It's I just look at each one of these and I look at on that symbol. Like if I had a zero, when I read the zero, I, where am I transitioning to? So I look at that for each one of these states that's inside the curly braces here. And when I do this, I'm going to take an union together all those set of states and that represents a label for a state that it's going to transition to that corresponds to one of the states that I have over here. So let's continue. Now we got two more rows, Q1, Q2. So Q1 on a zero goes to Q2, correct? But Q2, it doesn't do anything. With that, it just simply is going to, it's going to kill that thread, okay? So, so it's just going to, on Q1, it's just going to go to Q2 on a zero. It won't do anything in the other case when it reads a one, right? There's no transitions out of Q1 on a one, neither are the case for Q2, correct? And lastly, we have our last row. So Q0, Q1, Q2. So for all of them, when I read a zero, Q0, actually let's do this one carefully. So when I read a zero in Q0, I stay in Q0. So this would be the case when I read off Q0, right? When I look at Q1, See, I'm missing a comma there. There we go. When I read Q1, when I read a zero, it says to go to Q2, right? And when I do this with Q2, there are no transitions out of Q2 or into Q2 from itself. So there is nothing, right? So here I end up with Q0, Q2. And for a one, let's go through the same process again. So remember this was for Q2. So for Q0, when I read a one, I get Q0, Q1, right? It goes to, it's, it stays in Q0, but it also goes to Q1, right? Because we read a one. So it goes shoo, like this. <laughs> uh, then, so this is for Q0. Okay, for Q1, there is no transition with a one, and there's no transition with a one on Q2 either. So we end up with just Q0, Q1. Boom. So now, now we in fact have a transition table for a DFA. And that is the resulting DFA from the subset construction. Now, you might be staring at this and be like, Dan, Dan, that looks a little scary with all those subsets. Well, what could you do with this? So I'm going to leave this as an exercise. But what you could do is you can relabel all of these states. So instead of calling this one empty set, you can call this like A. You can call this one B, this C, this D, this E this F, this G, and H. You can relabel all of these states. So I can... When you finish, you can relabel the states and remove and remove unreachable states. So what I'm saying is, for example here on this one row, everywhere where you see empty set, you're gonna put an A there instead. And anywhere you see empty set here, you put A. So you're just I'm simply saying replace anywhere where you see this subset in this table with B and C and D and so on. You can go through this entire process. I have the full example in the notes. But when you've done this process, you're going to end up with a DFA that looks like this. 
So if you get rid of all of those states and you label them like this, you'll end up with a DFA that looks like this. I must stress that when you don't remove all of those unreachable states, it'll look like there's a lot of other stuff going on. So you'll have a start state of B. So B is the start state because this is the subset that contains Q0 only. So it has, so it'll have B, E, F. It'll look just like this. Where F is the final state. This is like an appropriate name for the final state. <laughs> um, so I think that's all of their transitions. So zero, one, one, zero, one. So this would be what the DFA would look like if you were to go through and do this last step. It's not required for the subset construction. It's just something that if you really want to clean it up after, you're welcome to do that. But as I've described to you, there is a way to simplify this subset construction such that you already get rid of all the unreachable states. So this is the DFA as a result where states are relabeled. Relabeled and unreachable states are removed. Boom. And that's all there is to the subset construction. Pretty nifty, right? So with this process, and I haven't proven it to you, just to be very clear, I have not proven that the subset construction indeed correctly does this. That's something we will prove though, but I need to first, I want to first show you the process. <laughs> so are there any questions, any questions? I know there was a pretty epic indeed that came out earlier. I definitely heard that one loud and clear. <laughs> This marker's starting to give me a little trouble, so I'm going to shoot her off. But are there any questions about the subset construction or any other questions? Woo! It's gone. Let's see how this marker is. That one's pretty good. Are there any questions about the subset construction? Because what we're going to do next is we're going to see how we can specialize the subset construction such that we never have it where it uses, it has all, so we're going to try to get rid of the issue for which we have a lot of these rows. You'll notice that this DFA at the end only has three states in it, right? Many of these states, they're in here, but there's many states that are absolutely just unnecessary. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to actually be showing you how to take the subset construction and apply it in a lazier fashion, such that we never have to account for the rows that I just simply, they, they never are reachable. And it's beautiful part about it is it's actually going to combine some intuitions from graph algorithms to do this. So you're gonna see that this is actually going to pop up in a nice natural way. And I must stress that the intuition behind using this type of graph traversal approach is not strange at all. And in fact, it generalizes to much broader models of computation. If we're talking about converting a, a non-deterministic machine to a deterministic one. It still is possible to have this blow up happen, but most certainly we don't wanna have a whole bunch of just <laughs> There's a lot of this stuff that, that we don't need at all. Does everybody see that? It's, I only have three states here. So I'm going to show you actually how to take the same DFA, sorry, the same NFA, and I'm actually going to show you how to turn it into this DFA with much less work. At least t in the typical case, uh, when we talk about it, where it isn't going to be that intuitively there's going to be states that are going to produce an exponential number. Instead, it's going to be that, like, keep in mind, we cannot avoid that circumstance with the subset construction. 
um, at least as we have the procedure described, because the procedure describes it as so, that each one of these subsets is a row, right? I would like to get rid of that constraint on the subset construction. I would like it to be that we only include a row when that state is actually reachable. So the machinery we're going to be using to achieve this is actually from graph algorithms. So here's the idea. So I, let me erase, erase uh, this guy here, but I want you to keep in the back of your mind this DFA, okay? So please keep this one in mind. I'm gonna keep this NFA here, but we're gonna talk about the so-called lazy subset construction over on that board. So I'm just gonna erase this. But once we have the subset construction well understood and we prove that it is indeed correct, then we have one part of the proof that we're gonna to need today. And once we have this piece, we can move on to talking about the equivalency of DFAs and NFAs in terms of the languages they recognize, concluding in the ultimate fact that NFAs only recognize regular languages, which is, <laughs> For those that are really excited about non-determinism, it's kind of disappointing in some regards. <laughs> I don't know. If I had this magic machine that was able to tell the future, <laughs> I would be awfully disappointed by that fact. That we would need more. We need more. That's all I'm saying. We need more. <laughs> we need more functionality for our model of computation or so-called uh, automata to be able to, to do more in terms of the languages we can recognize. And remember the intuition here, the intuition hiding behind all of this is the fact that if I give you one of these finite state automatons, it's the case that it recognizes a certain set of languages. So far we've established that there exist these things called regular languages. But what if there's other languages out there and we just don't know how to do it quite yet? And that's what we're going to explore as we progress through our theory computation lectures. So hopefully that gets you excited. Is that I will give you a heads up. There are other languages than regular languages. But before we can kind of do that, we need to really classify carefully what the regular languages are. So we're going to see today, by the end of today, you'll know exactly why the NFAs and DFAs are computationally equivalent to each other. That also means that there's also other ways of characterizing the regular languages. So a third piece to this are things called regular expressions, which we're also going to talk about, not today, but in the future. So once we have those that trifecta, we're going to end up with a theorem called Claney's theorem that characterizes all three of these. So you can always jump between one characterization to another. So for example, if I have a DFA, I can show you how to take that and turn it into another type of thing that represents a regular language. Or if I have an NFA, or actually what we're gonna be seeing next time is I'm gonna show you how to take an NFA and buff it up even further. And I also will show you there that it still doesn't give you any more computational power. <gasps> So in that case, we're going to allow it so that the input doesn't actually have to even read on a symbol, which that, that's sort of strange at first, but we'll see more about that next time. But let's, uh, let's talk now about the lazy subset construction. So we've addressed one issue. So let me just summarize what we've got at our, on our hands here. Uh, let me just make sure I got our spot correctly. Don't want to get ourselves too ahead of our, <laughs> too ahead here. Okay. Okay, so previously we'd seen the subset construction. This allows us to take an NFA and convert it over to being a DFA. So we construct such a DFA. And one issue that we ran into with our subset construction was that it actually creates an exponential number of states. Now. Naturally, this is not going to be an easy thing to get rid of as a feature, at least one that will always happen in the sense that there exists some DFA that causes there to be an, ex sorry, some NFA such that there exists an exponential number of states for the DFA. However, in our construction for the subset, sorry, our, our, I get really excited here. Whenever we get to these little intricate complexity issues, I'm just, I'm in my zone, okay? 
<laughs> okay. One issue with the subset construction is we explicitly define every one of the states to be some subset of the set of states for the NFA, right? I would like to show you how we can build the DFA such that we don't actually have to explicitly do this. Instead, we only include the states that are reachable from the start state. So this brings me to talking about the so-called lazy subset construction. So you're going to think of this, and when I use the word lazy, I'm, I'm using it playfully, okay? I'm not saying that this is a lazy as it's bad or something. I'm saying that it, it's less work, okay? <laughs> so it's going to address this technical issue with the subset construction. So it won't necessarily guarantee that there won't be an exponential number of states. However, it will make sure that there was no unreachable states that we're going to have in our transition table for the resulting DFA. So, so lazy subset construction. So the lazy subset construction combines two ideas. Combines two ideas. So the first one, of course, is the subset construction itself, right? <laughs> It'd be kind of weird if it didn't. But the other one is quite natural for if you think about the NFA as a graph. We're going to combine this idea with breadth first search. So we've previously talked about this actually when we talked about graphs some time ago. So if you're curious about graph algorithms, I've talked about those before. So we're going to take these two ideas and bring them together. And believe it or not, if, you, if you've never heard of what this is, that's okay. It's fairly intuitive. I need to get my hat though. I dropped my hat. I need my hat <laughs> to make this work, okay? Because we're going to go exploring on the NFA. So we want states uh, reachable or accessible, reachable by the start state. So we will only explore over transitions reachable from the start state. Reachable from the start state. Makes sense, right? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to go start looking at transitions for states for which we've not established that they actually are reachable, right? Remember, I could have went through that table for the subset construction in any one of the rows and computed them correctly, right? I would like to instead start off at the start state and compute the table as I discover new states or new subsets to be a bit more precise. So we're gonna have a couple bits of terminology here. So we call any subset where we have not written a row for it in the transition table Translation table discovered. So here we go. 
So what we're so keep in mind that actually I should say that they're they're um I'm pretty sure it's not that they're not discovered here. Actually, let's read this carefully. We call any subset where we have not written a row for it in the transition table discovered. Because we got a couple knots here. <laughs> well, anyways, let me walk you through this process. So we're going to first declare that the start state of the DFA would be, in fact, discovered. So that means that we're going to add a row for it. Begin with the start state. Which is going to be the subset containing Q0 of D. It is discovered. So we're going to call that discovered. For those wanting to think about this in terms of breadth per search, you're going to imagine I st I'm putting down which vertex you're starting at, if you're thinking about the graph traversal method here. So this is where I'm starting the process. So you can think of this like I'm marking that vertex. So what's going to happen is I'm going to work one step out, two steps out, three steps out, four steps out, and so on, akin to breadth per search. I'm going to mark as discovered those, ver those vertices which are states in the transition diagram. So as I discover new subsets of states, those are going to go into the transition table. So just to summarize here, the ones that are going to be reachable from the start state, they're going to be labeled eventually discovered here. So we're going to start off with the start state for the DFA, so that particular subset, because we know that's the start state. And we're going to now keep applying the following process. So it's so important, I'm going to put it over here. So, so while there is a discovered state. State Q. So I recommend that you explore these in the order in which they are being discovered in a breadth-wise manner. So in the way that we would use this for breadth first search, okay? Add a new row. Add a new row for Q in the transition table. Where Q's transitions are as described in the subset construction. So what's going to happen, just to be very clear, you're going to start off with the start state. You're going to add a row for that. And by definition, I've said it's discovered. So it means that whenever I don't have a state that is quite yet has its own row from our, for our DFA, which remember is a subset, whenever I just don't have one yet, I'm going to then whenever I encounter it, I add a row for it. And, I, and if I haven't accounted for all of its transitions as per the subset construction, it would be discovered. So I want to go through this whole process now of building it using step two. So you imagine it like I start up this process, I start one step into the graph, and then what I do is I see if I have any new, d new states, or, or our case for the DFA that's a subset, if I have any new ones I've discovered, 
I add a row for it, and now I have to account for its transitions. If I find any new subsets that are discovered, as for what I said over here, we're going to then add a row for those respectively and continue in a breadthwise manner. So remember, when I say add a new row for that queue, remember this should be done in a breadthwise manner. So this is just to be a little bit more natural to the literal interpretation. So you'll see what I mean when we get to the example. So let's do an example here. So I'm going to use the same NFA we had from the subset construction. Remember, the NFA is going, we're going to be constructing a DFA from this NFA. And now we're going to apply this process instead. So remember, by definition, the start state for the DFA would be discovered. So I'm going to do what? Well, there is a discovered state Q. You're going to add a row for Q in the transition table. So that's, a, that's going to be added to our transition table. And now what do I do? I apply how we view in the subset construction. How do we take these, right? Remember, I look at this state. I look at each one of the states in this subset. I carry out the transition function on each one of these for that symbol. So on symbol zero, for this state, Q0, it stays in Q0, right? But in one, it's Q0, Q1, right? So notice that Q0, is, it's, it's been discovered already, right? But I've already counted for it. So I've already added a row for it. However, notice that Q0, Q1, this subset is discovered. I haven't accounted for it. I haven't added a row for it. So notice step two tells me that I'm supposed to add a row now for this one. So add a row for the discovered state, Q. And now what I'm gonna do is go through the same process. Q0, Q0 on a zero, stays in Q0. Q1 on a zero, goes to Q2. We have Q0, Q2. On a one, Q zero on a one. It says it goes Q zero, Q one, right? Does it have anything else going on? In Q one, when it reads a one, it doesn't go anywhere. It, it dies in quotation marks. <laughs> so notice that, that this one already have a row accounted for it, but I've discovered Q zero, Q two, right? Do you see that? So remember, any ones that I encounter in the transition table along one of these rows, when I see one that is now discovered, by definition, any one that I have not accounted for in the table is discovered, but I need to encounter it to reveal it, right? <laughs> so, so, while, so now step two tells me, hey, look, what's the next one I haven't accounted for in a row? Well, I already have Q0, Q1, so Q0, Q2 is the next one. Okay, on a zero, Q zero stays in Q zero, on a zero with Q two goes, it, 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 it dies in quotation marks. So you just get Q zero on a one, Q zero goes in the Q zero and then Q one, Q two doesn't do anything, it sort of dies there. Okay, do you see any, any discovered states for the DFA? Not anymore, right? Because, uh, well, technically all of these have rows for them, right? So we cease this process. Two is done. So notice that now I've accounted for all of the discovered states. There are no more I can find. Notice that Q0, Q0 and Q1, they're already, I already found them, right? I've already gone far enough in. So just to give you an intuition behind what I'm talking about here. When I go to Q0, when I read a zero, Notice that I could be in Q0 and I stay in Q0, right? So notice I didn't go anywhere when I took one step into the graph. On a one, 
I can be Q0 or Q1. So on one step, I, be, I can go into these two states, right? That means I have discovered this state for the DFA, remember? So now I have this one here. So now upon being in this state, I could potentially take another step, either on a zero or one. So on a zero, or on a one. And you'll see that this corresponds to taking another step in upon finding that new set of states. So do you see the intuition? So if you find yourself preferring this kind of one step in approach, you can basically carry out the same process with the transition diagram. However, I would strongly recommend sticking to the transition table. What's the last thing we have to still do with our transition table? We, we still have one last thing that we still have to do. We still have to label the start state which remember, the DFA, it's this one. And notice this contains Q2, so it's a final state. When I draw out the resulting DFA, this should look awfully familiar to you from our discussion of the subset construction. Boom, I just need to label that. There you go. There's the resulting transition diagram for the DFA. Now notice it has three rows, just like what I told you about it, if you were to get rid of the unreachable states for our just vanilla subset construction. So by augmenting subset construction with breadth for search, we're able to never have to worry about the unreachable states. Pretty nifty, right? Sorry, I'm just, I'm just dying from excitement here. <laughs> so are there any questions about the subset construction? Any at all? So the lazy subset construction is what we've done here. So remember the difference between lazy and the non-lazy version is that in the non-lazy version, you would include a row for every subset. In the lazy version, you'd only include rows for the reachable states, right? But namely, the process that you use would be this breadthwise approach. I must stress, by the way, if you're curious, it doesn't really matter that I do it explicitly in a breadthwise way. It could be that you choose to just check the, this state before that state, as long as you encounter it. So as long as you do, in fact, add a row for a discovered state that has, it doesn't have its own row yet, it doesn't matter which order you do them in. Just the thing is, if you're doing it in a breadthwise way, it's easier to carry out the lazy subset construction. I just personally would strongly recommend just sticking to using a breadthwise approach. That way it keeps things nice and simple. Then also this would be naturally how you would actually implement the lazy subset construction. Is you would imagine you have a queue. So you have a queue for which whenever you see one of these that isn't, that is that is so-called discovered, but it lacks a row, you would have a mechanism to check this. And if it, if it is one of the ones, but it isn't in the table yet, you'd, a, you'd enqueue it to your queue, akin to what you do in breath, in a breath first search. So that's actually how you could implement the lazy subset construction. You use a queue just like you would for breath first search. The difference now is that the subsets are the labels for your DFA. The trick is just how you're walking through this graph. Okay. So what I was thinking of doing next before we get to our first proper proof is I was thinking we'd probably a good idea we do a couple more examples of the lazy subset construction. Probably would be a wise idea, just to be honest with you. 
Just taking a look at what we got going ahead. Okay. Okay, we're heading in some fun territory next. <laughs> I'm getting quite excited about this. Okay. So I'm just gonna erase this. We're gonna do a couple more examples of applying the lazy subset construction. So let me just erase these. Just gonna clean up the boards here and then we're gonna do some examples. Again, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. I'm very happy to answer any questions. If you have anything fun to say, or in fact, if you have any fun plans this week, please let me know in the chat. Yeah, we're gonna do a couple examples applying the lazy subset construction. Okay. I think it'd probably be a wise idea we do a couple more tricky, we'll do a couple trickier examples. So previously we had seen the lazy subset construction. I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of applying it. So I'm gonna remind you of some of the steps in our first example, and then we'll go a little faster on our second example. So let's consider the following NFA, or non-deterministic finite automaton. So we're going to call this one N1, but here we go. It's going to have three states, Q0, Q1, and Q2. Q1 is going to be a final state. The start state is going to be Q0 here, just to keep things simple for us. We're going to have one and a zero leaving Q0 on Q2 and Q1 respectively. We're going to have a self loop with a 0 and a 1 on Q0. And we're going to have a transition from Q2 to Q1 on a 1. So this is our NF, this is NFA and 1. And we're going to be applying the lazy subset construction to the following NFA. So applying. the lazy subset construction, construction on N1, we obtain DFA D1 as follows. So let's walk through this process carefully. So I'm gonna use the transition table. So remember, we have two input symbols, zero and one. I'm going, the DFA is always gonna have as a subset, because Q0 is the start state, it's gonna be this subset specifically. That's gonna be the start state. And now we're gonna go through this process. So let's check this out. So on Q, on the sub, so on state Q0, because that's the only state we have in this subset, remember it's a label, right? This is a label. So on Q0, when I read a zero, it goes Q0 to Q1, right? So it stays in Q0, but it also can go to Q1. So I have the subset Q0, Q1. And on a one, when I read a one, it stays in Q0, but it can also go to Q2. So notice that I discovered Q0, Q1 first. So I'm just gonna write a row for that because that's what I'm supposed to do. Q0, Q1. Naturally, next one I would do one for a row for is this one right here. So for Q0, Q1, okay. Q0, Q1. So on Q0, when I read a zero, it says, akin to what I had before, it should be Q0, Q1 is the subset. Then I have to consider Q1. 
So remember, I'm going to consider the transitions out from that state. And I'm going to take from each one of these, I'm just going to lump the states together in one subset appropriately. So in Q1, when I read a zero, there are no transitions out of Q1, right? So that's the empty set. So it means that the resulting entry here is Q0, Q1. Just like the one just above it, interesting enough. Now we have uh, on a one, Q0. Q0 on a one goes Q0, Q2. So it transitions into two states, Q0 and Q2. And for Q1, again, then transition anywhere. It, it, it dies. <laughs> so Q0, Q2, exact same one. So next I have Q0, Q2. That was the next one I had discovered. I don't have a row for it though. So I'm going to now add a row for that. So next, say Q0, Q2. When I read a zero, it's Q0, Q1 for Q0. And on zero, notice there's no transitions out of Q2. So it's just gonna be Q0, Q1 again. However, on a one, on a one, Q0, sorry, Q0, on a zero, stays in Q0, but also goes to Q1. But also, if it's in Q2 on a one, it goes to Q1. So that means it actually will include every one of the states. Naturally, I've just discovered another state that for which it isn't a row. Q0, Q1, and Q2. Okay, so now I have all three of the <laughs> three of the states from the NFA. So Q0 on a zero is Q0, Q1, right? On Q1, upon reading a zero, nothing. That's the empty set. Q2 on a zero. Nothing, nothing. <laughs> so it's just gonna be Q0, Q1 again. How about on a one for this subset? What would it be? It's going to be, okay, Q0 goes Q0, Q2, right? On one. On Q1, nothing, right? So remember, this is for Q0. This is Q1. And for Q2, on a one goes to Q1, right? So notice that it's just the same subset again. It's Q0, Q1, Q2. We're not quite done labeling our transition table it, right? right? Sorry, I'm getting really excited here. Okay, there's only Q1 is the final state. So I need to indicate the final states. So Q0, Q1, that one is, is a final state. And this bottom one is as well, because both of them contain Q1. That's how we know it should be a final state in the DFA. So I encourage you now to draw this as the transition, sorry, the transition diagram for this DFA. Also, I encourage you to relabel this DFA so that they just don't look like subsets anymore. But, uh, but th this is me applying the lazy subset construction. Notice that it does not contain any states that are unreachable from the start state. So that's the benefit of the lazy subset construction over its vanilla counterpart. So let's do another example. Let's do another example. So let's consider the following NFA. So again, three states. I like to keep it simple. <laughs> but remember, the principles apply here. Remember, the idea is that we're trying to explore, explore by taking one step into the graph, two steps in the graph, three steps in the graph. And the subsets in question are those for which we have states for the DFA.
and the end. So remember, as we discover states, whenever they don't have a row, we, ex we include a row for them in a breadthwise manner. That just keeps it easy for us to keep track of them. You can imagine, you can actually imagine this as if every time I encounter a state that is discovered, but we don't have a row for it, I put it in a queue. <laughs> just like you would in a breadth burst search because those subsets correspond to vertices that are states for the DFA. So here we go. So imagine this is NFA N2. We're going to build the DFA D2 using the lazy subset construction. So I'm going to draw it out the transition table. I find it's easy to keep track of that way. So I have two input symbols, A and B. So remember Q0, oh, I got to put the start state. Don't forget that. That's really important not to forget indicating the start states. I will tell you up front, <laughs> you don't want to forget indicating little details like that in your transition diagrams. Start states, final states, labeling transitions. Otherwise, you may have an incomplete description for your NFA or DFA. So this would be the start state because Q0 is the start state. This is the subset in question for our DFA. So I'm going to indicate it as the start state. Okay. When I read an A it on this, this uh, so I look at each state in here, Q0 on an A. The only one it can transition to is Q1. On B, there's nothing there, right? <laughs> so now I've discovered this state and I've discovered this state or subsets. I've discovered these two. However, they don't have rows. So I'm going to examine this one first because I discovered that one first. Then I'm going to do this one next. Notice that as long as you do it in an order for which it keeps, it's easy to keep track of, you're okay. So you can imagine like you evaluated B first versus A, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. Okay, so next we have Q1. Okay, Q1 on an A. Notice there's no transitions out on A. So we've encountered the empty set, which again, now this is it, we, 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 are going, we haven't yet added a row for this one, but I've already noticed it, it's already somewhere hiding around, right? We will, we will account for that state. Then I have Q1, Q2, right? It could stay in Q1 or it could be in Q2. Next, I have Q, I have the empty set. Okay, on the empty set. Can I, tr I don't have any states, right? <laughs> I don't have any states, it's pretty much a piece of cake. Then I have this one, this was the next one I've discovered, but doesn't have a row. So Q1, Q2. So Q1 or Q2, when I read an A, nothing, right? However, on B, Q1 can transition into Q1 or Q2. And Q2, there's nothing going in and out of Q2. Sorry, there's things coming in, but nothing going out. So we end up with Q1, Q2 again. Notice that now I have, have all of the discovered states, but all of them have a row now. Notice that Q2 is the only one with the final state. So I'm going to indicate that appropriately for our transition table. And finally, let's draw the picture. Let's see what the transition diagram looks like. So this is what, what D2 will look like. So we're going to have the state for which it's Q0 like this, right? Okay, on A, it goes to a state labeled by the subset Q1. Does that on an A. However, on a B, it goes to this state labeled by the empty set.
Okay, so now on Q1, on an A, it transitions over to the state on the empty set. On B, however, it transitions to Q1, Q2, so that's another state. And that'll be our last of the four states. It's a final state. On the empty set, it's tr it transitions on the empty set regardless of which symbol you have. And then finally, on A, Q1, Q2 goes to this so-called, uh, by the way, these, these states right here, this is often called a dead state. Sometimes when people talk about DFAs where they have a dead state, uh, they may actually just straight up omit this, this state. Although technically speaking, that is in fact an NFA once you remove this state from the transition diagram. But sometimes implicitly, you may want to just describe a DFA where it has these so-called dead states accounted for. But it's technically speaking, if you didn't include this state in the DFA, it would be an NFA because you would actually not be labeling all the possible transitions. It'd be implicit that it actually just, the thread dies for that appropriate state. Because remember, it's still an NFA if that's the case, right? Because in, in the transition function for NFA, you're allowed to pick any subset of the states that includes none. So I just thought I would mention that in practice, some people will draw the DFA for which when they have, when they need a dead state, they'll just simply not include that in the transition diagram because it makes really, it makes it really ugly. Cause you can imagine you have many, many states. They all have arrows pointing at one single state. Uh, but remember, technically speaking, when you end up with like removing this explicitly, it is actually an NFA. And in fact, a neat thing about the subset construction is when you apply it to that NFA, you end up with one with the dead state in it. So lastly, we got one last guy right here on the B, on a B. There you go. So there is the resulting transition diagram for this is DFA D2. This is the transition diagram for DFA D2. So I thought it'd be a good idea. We've seen a couple of examples of applying the lazy subset construction. Pretty nifty, right? <laughs> so that's that's the subset construction. So any questions, any questions at all before we start moving into kind of the more inch, I would argue the more interesting elements of the subset construction. Namely, we're going to first see how to prove that the subset construction is correct. Please note that the lazy subset construction is merely an optimization trick for the subset construction. Because remember, what we're doing is we're taking advantage of the fact that we start at the start state and we only add rows for subsets for which that are reachable from the start state. So I'm not going to give an explicit proof for the lazy subset construction. However, if you're convinced that breadth for search works, which you can prove using induction, uh, you can imagine you take that and you just add it on top of the proof that I'm giving you here. So what you would do is instead of having it where you consider all possible subsets, instead you would just say, okay, well, in the previous iteration, you had this set of subsets. And now I want to show you that you take the next step in your breadth per search. It would be on these ones as per the subset construction. And the part of the proof here that you're not, not right here, but what we're going to see next would be what you put there for the induction step. It just would be on those subsets. Okay. So let's erase the boards and we're going to get into some of the, the, our last part of the lecture here today, which I'm really excited about because, because then we'll address one of our questions we had from last time. So while I'm erasing this, I just wanted to mention that if you enjoy or like watching this, um, please consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash pagewizard. We have all sorts of rewards over there. One thing I didn't mention at the beginning of the lecture is if you're looking to get access to the examples and notes from today's lecture, they'll be available there at the supporter access level and above. 
almost every live lecture I do, so there's well over a hundred pages of notes that I've compiled at this stage since I've started doing these more regularly. Uh, that include examples and they go correspondence with the lectures that we do here together. So if you're looking for some serious bang for buck, uh, consider supporting on the supporter level or above. We also have a Discord server. It's, it's not very active right now, but I, I most certainly interact with people on it. If we can get more people to be there, however, I like posting fun memes and so on. <laughs> you also get to hear a little bit more about the behind the scenes stuff here. Uh, which one do we got here? I think, let's put this one over here. <laughs> We're getting into the juicy stuff here. So let me just get this off for now. Woo. Keep it myself, whoops, I, I just about tripped over something. <laughs> that was pretty epic. <laughs> okay. I'm just checking a couple quick things on my end here. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's get into our next part of our lecture. So previously we'd shown that the substance construction is in fact, like what it is and how we can use it. But uh, I need to actually prove that it's correct, right? You can't just you can't just take my word for it, okay? If somebody in a computer science lecture just says, "Trust me, bro," <laughs> it usually tells you right up front that maybe it's a good idea to evaluate for yourself if you're really unsure about it. Um, and that's why I'm trying to deliver quality lectures where we actually address these things. At least when I think it's things it, it's merited, okay? But if you find yourself ever watching my lectures and you're like, Dan, you, how do you know that this is true? Can you show me this? Please tell me, okay? That way it gives me an opportunity to come up with another lecture to show you how you would check this. Okay, so previously we had seen the subset construction and we also seen its lazy counterpart which is a combination of breadth burst search and the subset construction. But I haven't shown you that indeed the subset construction does what is claimed. So we're going to be now proving the correctness of the subset construction. So this is going to be one key element of proving that indeed all NFAs recognize regular languages. So this is one key component of that proof. Right, Miss Kitty? Miss Kitty's hanging out with us. So let DFA D be equal to QD sigma delta D. So this is the transition function for a DFA. The subset Q0, remember this is a label for a state. Yeah, exactly, Miss Kitty. I know, I know, right? be the result be the result of the subset construction be the result of the subset construction applied applied to NFA n which is going to be have the set of states being QN. Yeah, it's going to have the same input symbols, Miss Kitty. Then it has a transition function that's for an NFA, QN. It has star state Q0 without curly braces. It's Q0, F, N. The main claim here is that if we consider these two, it will be the case that the language of D, the DFA, is in fact equal to the language of N, the NFA. Right, Miss Kitty? Right? Yeah, I know, you're just so darn excited about this claim, aren't ya? Yeah, she's quite excited about it. I'm just gonna get another marker here.
So let's prove this claim together. So you might ask Dan, what's the game plan here? Well, previously when we examined DFAs and NFAs, we took advantage of the inductive definition that it has for its computations. And we know the definition of what it means to accept a string with a DFA or an NFA. So why don't we use that inductive definition to help us prove that the languages of these two automata are the same. So we're going to use mathematical induction on the length of the string to achieve this. So we're going to let w be a string over the alphabet. Now, here comes a, 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 an important observation for us to prove this claim using the definition of the language of each of these. Observe that both... Yeah, Miss Kitty, I know, we're going to get this observation in place. Observe that both D and N accept, accept in the following circumstances. If and only if, if and only if, both delta hat, so we're going to use the extended transition function for the NFA and the DFA. I'm going to label these with N and D respectively for the NFA and DFA. Q0, W. If both this and delta hat D on this state, W, contain a state in Fn. So just remember that even though that's a subset of the states, it's still a state. Likewise, when I consider the state in the DFA, that's still a subset, but when it operates within the DFA, it's a, it's a label. So please note that distinction. But this is still nonetheless true. So if I interpret the, the, the label of that state, one of them is going to be in Fn. That's what we want to observe here. So now we actually have the machinery necessary to actually prove this claim. We prove via mathematical induction induction on the length of the string w that the following claim is true. That delta hat on the state Q0, or the subset containing only Q0, W is equal to delta hat N of Q0, W. So what I'm saying is, if you look at this guy with the DFA, it has to equal, so whatever this subset, which would be a label for the DFA, it has to equal whatever's over there for the NFA, which would be a set, a sub, some, uh, some subset of the states. Right, Miss Kitty? So we need to, I need to remind you about how mathematical induction works. So Miss Kitty, you're going to help me do this, okay? So we're going to be applying the principle of mathematical induction. So to do this, I'm going to get Miss Kitty's help, okay? So remember, in the principle of mathematical induction, to use it require, requires us to do two things. First, imagine Miss Kitty is trying to climb up a bunk bed so she can nap in the bed on the top of the bunk bed. I would like to show Miss Kitty how to do this. So one thing I could do is show Miss Kitty some sufficiently first steps of rung so she gets an idea of how to put herself onto the ladder to get up the bunk bed. So she might start with the first step or potentially the next step and so on. But only, only we, we only want to have so-called our base steps. 
So we need enough to convince us that there's a small number of cases that for which it will work for our claim. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take Miss Kitty. We're going to put her on two arbitrary rungs. So I'm going to start her on one rung. And in weak induction, what I would do is I would take and show her how to climb up an arbitrary next rung from that step. So it has to follow. So that if I put Miss Kitty on any one of the rungs, she would know how to climb up on an arbitrary rung so that when I put her at the bottom of the ladder, she could climb up the entire ladder up to the bunk bed. So that's what we're going to use mathematical induction for on the length of the string w. So if we can establish this claim for all strings of length 0 and above, we have proven the claim. Because for this to be true, it has to be that this is also true. Okay, Miss Kitty? Very thankful. Very thankful for your help. So let's start off with the base step. So this is when the string has length zero. And there's only one string that has length zero, correct? It's just the empty string. Right, Miss Kitty? It is the empty string. So W is the empty string. So now what we do is we pick up the basis parts of the definition. Yes, Miss Kitty, I haven't forgotten. We need to make sure we remember those definitions. But, Miss <laughs> Kitty, you're going crazy at the moment, aren't you? You're really excited about all of this. By the basis of delta hat, so the extended transition function, in either case, notice that delta hat d, so this is for the DFA, So delta hat with Q0, the subset Q0 with epsilon, and delta hat on the NFA for Q0 epsilon, they're going to be the subset only containing N, uh, Q0. Right? If you read nothing, it keeps you in the same state for the NFA which translates naturally to a, the same subset for the DFA. So there's our base step. Now that's all we're going to need surprisingly for our case here. So now let's get to the induction step. So this is when we're going to imagine that We're given Miss Kitty one rung arbitrarily, and we're going to show that it follows that we show her how to get to the next rung from our current rung. But notice that we don't know anything about where we are on the ladder, right? So I can't just simply assert something for that given value. I have to use what we call the induction hypothesis. So fix sum n or equal to 0, right? Because we use 0 because we proved the claim for when n would be equal to 0. So I want to show you when you get to the next rung that when I prove it for 0 and I show you how it follows that 1 for n is equal to 1 it holds, then for 1 it has to hold for 2, for 2 it has to hold for 3, and, four, and so on and so on. And that's how we would use the principle of mathematical induction here. Then let the length of w be n plus 1, assuming, assuming the statement holds. So the statement adds in our observation. The statement holds. for all w, all strings of length n. This is our induction hypothesis. So now, just like we've done previously for 
using induction, this is specifically the inductive part of the definition of these extended transition functions, we're just going to decompose the string into two parts. Consider w is equal to xa, where for a is the last symbol of w. And x would be everything but a, right? <laughs> everything but the last symbol. Well, by the induction hypothesis, what can we say? Well, remember, x has what length? What's the length of x? What's the length of x? It's n. Exactly, Miss Kitty. So that means that we can use it by the induction hypothesis delta hat of d subset q0 x is equal to delta hat of n q0 x. And now what we're going to do is we're going to use, to take advantage of how we define the extended transition function for the inductive case, we're going to use that here specifically on the NFA. So that way we could see what states would come out as a result of this side. And let, so this is just from our definition, P1, P2, all the way up to PK, be the set of states of N for both of these. So I'm just giving it a name. So the result of this is that. So whatever the subset label would be for this, that's this. This would be the literal set of, uh, the little subset. Well, now let's use the inductive part of the definition. All by the inductive, inductive part of the definition of the extended transition function for NFA, what can we say? Well, what we could say is this, that delta hat n, so for the non-deterministic finite automaton, we could say q0 on q0 w is going to be the union. Remember, this is all we said was, this is literally in our definition. The union over all of the following. So I take each one of the sets, sorry, each one of the states, I read it on that symbol, and I look at all the states it transitions to, I lump them all together. That's what this says, correct? So I'm going to mark this and put the star on this. Right, Miss Kitty? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So now, what are we going to do with this? So watch this. Now there's a nice property that the subset construction actually has. So let's see what that is. Sorry, I had, I had to stop Miss Kitty. Miss Kitty was staring at the computer over there. <laughs> she could have taken the whole stream down. <laughs> She's gonna have to, I'm gonna have to give, give her a good talk after this. <laughs> in addition, in addition, a property, a property of the subset construction construction is that, well, what does the, what does the subset construction exactly do? 
well, remember, it does something like this. That the transition on on this, so imagine I give you this label for a subset on A. Now you interpret this as an actual subset. So if I read that on that symbol A, it's that this is actually all of these. This isn't actually terribly scary looking if you actually think about it. So I'm going to label that double star. So what this is saying is that when you read symbol A on this subset, what did we do? Well, for each one of each one of these, I look at this, right? That's what I do for each one of these. That, that's what's happening on the right-hand side. That's exactly what we did in the subset construction. So, how are we going to use these now? Well, watch this, watch this. So now I have these two to play around with. Since delta hat d q0 x is is resulting, it looks like this subset as that state. Applying the inductive part of the definition of a DFA, uh, inductive part, the inductive part of the definition of delta hat on a DFA, what can we say? So now that we have all these bits and pieces, I can actually tell you where and what state the DFA will go to. Because now I have something about x. I know what it's going to do. It's going to do something that looks like this. So let's put all the pieces together now. So delta hat d, suppose I give you the start state on w. Well, by definition of delta, it's delta d of, so I'm using the inductive part of the definition for delta hat. It's delta d where I apply it on x. Then I have the one symbol, right? But what's this? Well, this right here, we already established our set P1, P2, all about the PK, right? But remember, that's just a state in the DFA. But what's this? It's right there, right? So now let's start using these. Well, that's just the union from i is equal to 1 to k of delta of n of p i a. So this is by double star, right? That's double star. So this is by double star. But what's this? What's that? We had it over there. That was just star, right? So we know that's actually equal to something interesting, right? Well, this is delta hat n q0 w by star, right? Thus completing the induction step. Right? So now we have the induction step set up. We've shown how in you append A that we actually can use the definitions from the extended transition functions appropriately. We can actually show that whatever you get as that label, that subset, is going to be the same one for the NFA, from the DFA. So we start on one side, we gave the other side. Now, what do I have to do? There's one last step. 
One last step. We have to use the principle of mathematical induction and then now put our statement, the observation that we had to good use to establish that L of D is equal to L of N, right? We haven't quite done that yet. We need to use the principle of mathematical induction to help us do that. So, therefore, therefore, by the principle of mathematical induction, by the principle of mathematical induction, for all strings of length zero or more, delta hat d for q0 w is equal to delta hat m q0 w, where this is a subset, but it's also a label for the DFA. And as a result, based on our observation at the beginning of the proof, L of D is equal to L of N. Thus completing the proof, demonstrating the correctness of the subset construction. But yeah, no, so that's the, uh, now we've proved that the subset construction does indeed do what we've claimed. And now we have all the major pieces that we need to now prove the, our big, big, our, our big claim for today. So are there any questions about this proof? The one tricky thing for some students is understanding that in the DFA, well, like I said with my number five example, it is indeed reads the number five, but it's also on a card, right? So it's both things, right? <laughs> it's, we can treat it as a subset or it can treat it as a label. In this proof, some context it matters that it's a label, but it's literally, a, it is literally a label, but it also is helpful to think of it as a subset in the formal sense. So if you take that, that label and you treat it as a subset, we get this nice property. So we're moving into the last part of today's lecture. The big piece. Okay, so we're going to be doing this, but if, are there any questions before we get to our final part of today's lecture? So this is going to play a big role in finishing up everything. Okay, there doesn't appear to be any questions, so let's proceed. Let's proceed. So, before we get started, I just want to kind of give you back a roadmap from what where we were previously. So, just to summarize where we've come from up to this point, is we've established that we can take any NFA and turn it and or construct a DFA using something we call the subset construction. We, in addition, also seen something called the lazy subset construction, which is just a simple optimization of the subset construction. Previously, we had proven that the subset construction indeed does this, such that the language of the NFA is in fact equal to the language of the resulting DFA. So now with these bits and pieces together, we're going to prove this claim, namely, that for any DFA, there is an NFA that recognizes the same language and means after. A language L is recognized by a DFA if and only if 
if and only if L is recognized by a NFA. So, game plan, game plan. It's an if and only if claim. It's quite natural to prove this in two directions. So, so we prove, we prove both directions of the claim. So, there's two parts. So, what we could do is we could start off, for example, if L is recognized by an NFA, then L is recognized by a DFA. We could start with that, and then after that, maybe we can maybe prove that if L is recognized by a DFA, then it's recognized by an NFA. Now, the former of these two cases is much harder than the other one. So you might ask, Dan, why are you starting with the harder one first? Because we already did all of the heavy lifting and all of those proofs previously. We actually considered the subset construction, which is exactly what proves the first case. The second case is easier, but we still have to go through it carefully. So this direction of the proof, if L is recognized by NFA, then L is recognized by DFA. This follows from, from the correctness of the subset construction. What does that mean? Well, you can use the subset construction. You use the subset construction which takes an NFA and gives you a resulting DFA such that they have the same they recognize the same language. So that's the harder case. We already proved that in a previous lesson. Now, what we're proving in this direction is that L is recognized by a DFA only if L is recognized by an FA. So if L is recognized by a DFA, then it's recognized by an FA. Now, intuitively, this shouldn't be too terribly hard to understand if we understand what non-determinism and determinism's relationships are with each other. Right, Miss Kitty? Yes. So let's, uh, let's talk about this. So, do you recall me talking about how when you have a DFA, the way the execution is carried out is like a directed chain. We actually did an example illustrating this idea versus an NFA, which could be a directed tree for its execution. Now, once you realize this, you would agree, for those that are the graph, in, graph theorist or graph enthusiasts, I would rather, if you're a graph theory enthusiast, um, you might quickly see that, oh, a directed chain is, is a special kind of directed tree. So that intuition will be quite natural here. And that's exactly what we're going to do. But we're going to prove it using induction. So construct a NFA N from a DFA D Q sigma delta D Q zero F where where N is equal to Q sigma delta N Q zero F as follows. So notice that everything as I've defined it is the same amongst them, except for delta n and delta d. So the deterministic transition function versus the non-deterministic transition function. So this is the only part I have to specify, is if delta d qa 
is equal to P, then, so you go through each one of the transitions like this for the DFA, then delta N Q0A is going to be just the subset that contains P. So as I mentioned previously, you could just imagine it like I'm just taking whatever that state would be, like you imagine going from state to state to state to state, instead of it just being that you have one state, it's just that it's a subset with one state in it, which is the exact same thing in the context of non-determinism versus determinism. So in non-determinism, determinism is a special case for which there is only one state you transition to which is exactly the intuition as we discussed. So now I have to prove to you that these are in fact going to produce the same language. They're going to recognize the same language. To complete our proof, to complete our proof, we prove via mathematical induction by a mathematical induction on the length on the length of the string w which is just denoted like this that if delta hat for the deterministic version of this definition for the DFA, Q0W is equal to P, then it has to be for delta hat N, which is for the non-deterministic transition function. Well, we got to defined over here. We also have it for the, the extended transition function for the NFA. That's what this is. When I take Q0, epsilon, Actually, no, not epsilon, on W. We want to make sure it's W because we want to process the string W. We've got to show that it's going to give you the exact same state. So we're going to prove this using mathematical induction. And once we've done this, we've established the claim because now we've proven the other direction. So I'll start off with the base step. Base step. This will be when W the length of w is equal to zero, right? So we're going to start with all strings of length zero, but there's only one, right? It's just the empty string. It's just the empty string. That's all we got. So then w is in fact equal to the empty string. But now we just use the definitions respectively of the trans extended transition function, their base step, their basis by the bases, by the basis of delta hat for delta hat d and delta hat n. It has to be the delta hat d where you read no symbols. It stays in the exact same state, right? stays in the, sa the same state, namely the starting state. Then you can see quite quickly that delta hat, because by the same definition, you have it where it stays also in the same state, namely the, the subset containing just the start state, right? So that's all you need for the base step, right? Thus establishing it for all strings of length zero. Now we got to get to the induction. So we got to be careful here. But fortunately for us, this case is much easier than the other direction. Not nearly as many tricky steps really at all. There isn't really much. It's going to feel quite natural. That's why I like to show this, by the way, is that if you get a feel for how you would apply the inductive part of the definition of the transition function, in a much more general setting. So again, I'm going to fix some n greater equal to zero because I've established the claim for n is equal to zero. And assume 
assume the statement that namely are what we would like to prove. Assume the statement holds. Assume the statement holds for all strings of length n. So this is our induction hypothesis. Uh, we show how the statement follows follows for when the length of the string w is equal to n plus one. So now I got it. Now I got to show it for this case, but it has to follow it. So I got to use the induction hypothesis carefully here, because I don't know what the length of the string is at this time. So again, like I've done many times before, we're going to decompose the string into two parts. Let w equal x a, where a is the last symbol of w, and x is everything but a, right? Everything but the last symbol. So now, what can I say about x? What can I say about it? x has what length? What's its length? n, n, right? So I can use the induction hypothesis on x. If delta hat d q0 x is equal to q, then delta hat n q0 x is equal to the subset that just contains x. Now what we do is we use the inductive part of the definition for our transition functions to establish the claim carefully, okay? So let's watch this carefully. So watch this up. So by by the inductive part, of the definition of delta hat d, so that's an extended transition function for d, our DFA, then we could say delta hat d q0 w is in fact equal to the transition, right? Remember this is just the part of the definition, that delta it's delta d, so the transition on the result of applying the extended transition function on x, with the second input being a. So we want to see what happens when you read a. But here's the thing. We already know what this is. This is x, uh, not x. That is x, right? So what, what, what should I stick right here then? Oh yeah, that should also be a d right there. What should go right here? What did we establish from the induction hypothesis? What do we know? Right there. Just put Q right there. So this is equal to del delta D of Q on symbol A. So now we have something that tells us exactly where the DFA would be upon preparing itself to read symbol A. So let's see what happens. Okay. Now there's a nice property that a DFA has, right? How many states can a, can a DFA be in? Can it be in many states? No, it's just in one. It always stays in one state, right? So we're going to use that property. In a DFA, exactly one state is transitioned 
to so let delta d of q a equal p <laughs> so now imagine i have it being p <laughs> so so now imagine we have this then now what we do is we're going to look at the nfa very nice very nice i like that <laughs> um then, now what we're going to do, now we're going to appeal to the definition of how, well, how we constructed the NFA. By the construction, by the construction of N. So how we built the NFA. What did we say about the transition for QA? Well, it has to be that it's this subset, right? That's how we built it. Because if it was this, then it's this. And what does that mean? Well, if I look at the extended transition function now for the NFA, it's Q0W, which this now has to be what? Well, this is the same as me checking this. But as we establish, it's this, which is exactly what we sought to prove. Completing the induction step. Right, Miss Kitty? Completing the induction step. Okay. Now, now we have to do one more thing for our proof, for this side of the proof. We have to invoke the induction hypothesis, right? Because we're using mathematical induction. Therefore, by the principle of mathematical induction, for all n greater or equal to zero, if delta hat d q zero w is equal to p, then it has to be the delta hat n q0w is equal to the subset that only contains p. And that completes that completes this direction of the proof. And now we now have the two directions, and thus now I must conclude this. So that ends the second part of the proof. Therefore, therefore, there is, this marker is really it's on its last legs, everybody. Let's see if we can get it all the way to the end. There is a DFA. There is a DFA that accepts language L. L, if and only if there is, is a NFA. There is an NFA that accepts L. And that completes the proof. So you might ask Dan, what are the consequences of this theorem? The one that says that, okay, if there's, there's some language that is recognized by NFA, then that language is also recognized by DFA. Based on what we previously had discussed, if somebody asked you, can an NFA, a non-deterministic finite automaton, recognize more languages than a deterministic finite automaton, this theorem actually says, no, it cannot. Because you can imagine any language that is recognized by a DFA, that there has to now exist an NFA that recognizes that language and vice versa. So if I give you an NFA and I claim, oh, it doesn't recognize, like there is no DFA that recognizes it, you can always use the subset construction and present them a DFA that recognizes the same language. But there's another more deeper consequence of this is that we already said that deterministic finite automata recognize the regular languages. That also means that the non-deterministic counterparts, the non-deterministic finite automatons, also recognize only the regular languages, meaning that non-determinism in this context does not add any more computing power. These two 
abstract machines are computationally equivalent in the sense that they recognize the same languages. Pretty neat stuff, right? So, <laughs> so yeah, so this whole lecture we built up to this one result. So, <laughs> so we, we, we now know that a DFA, NFA, they just adding non-determinism. This and keep in mind, non-determinism is a very powerful idea, because you got to keep in mind this. I, and I'm just going to draw you a fun picture, really, to just hammer this in. So let me show you this. So while we're talking about this, we have any fun questions? I I already heard about some fun things about the USA <laughs> in the chat. Um, I'm going to give you an example of what I mean by this. So just to kind of, it should, at first when you hear this, it should sound really, like it, it, it shouldn't sound obvious until you've seen how the subset construction works. Uh, but let me give you an example here. So I'm going to revisit NFA that we had previously. So we've seen this one a few times, so it's not too strange for me to whip it out. Uh, one and zero. Okay. So imagine, so previously we actually seen how to build a DFA for this NFA. We use the subset construction, but I just want to remind you just what non-determinism is capable of doing. So imagine I give you a string that looks like this. Ah, uh, let's go. Go one 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 zero. So imagine the input is a one one, it's three ones with a zero. So here's how this NFA. I'm just going to expand it out at a high level for you. I'm not going to do the extended transition function here. So it starts off at Q zero. It reads the first one. It goes. It forks into two. It could be potentially in two one of two states. It could be in Q zero or it could be in Q one. And it does this at the exact same time. That's one way of interpreting this. So now, when it reads the next symbol, a 1, in Q0, it's like it's spawning two threads, Q0, Q1. When it's in Q1, it, when it reads a 1, it just dies here. So this thread just dies. Um, then it reads another 1. So I got Q0, Q1. So it spawns another new thread, uh, dies here again. And then, uh, so that's after we read three ones, then I read a zero. Well, here, on a zero, it can transition to Q2. On a zero here, it stays in Q0. Right? Well, in this case, this NFA would accept the string because one zero appears, and that's one pathway to get me here. So this would accept, in this case, but I must stress, and I really want to emphasize this, non-determinism is a very strange concept at first, really, because you could first imagine it like it's like a hyper-parallel process. That's one way you can think about this, where all of these are like threads that continue to get spawned. But the problem is, on a technical level, is that you, computers don't have an infinite number of threads. <laughs> uh, there's not... That's, that's kind of a strange idea at first. But it's very natural, it's, it's realistic in some sense. That if you had a bounded number of transitions and they match the number of threads that are possible with a multiprocessor, or sorry, a par we'll say with, say with like a GPU or something. Like imagine you had some way of forking these into several, actually I shouldn't use the word fork because that suggests concurrency. I should say, uh, say threads. Uh, suppose that you were able to spawn multiple threads on each one of these, and you imagine each one of these is literally the machine, and that pro processing element is in that state. Um, you can imagine it like this intuitively, like where, oh yeah, this one doesn't get to go any further, this one doesn't get to go any further. Eventually, there is one that successfully is reached, and when upon that is done, then the computation ceases. Uh, but in non-determinism, there is a much more, there is another way of thinking about this. And it's just as, it's not any less powerful than this. Just to be very clear in the draw, in the general sense. Because, just because the DFA takes and reads a finite length string, doesn't mean it's a kooky or strange idea, because remember, in the broadest sense, it could be possible that, imagine you were reading the input and you could write to the input at the same time. 
So suppose you're allowed to mutate this and you're not quite done reading the input until you're in a final state. Just in that example, you can imagine if, if there was some branch of execution, because you can imagine it's like that. You can imagine that the computation could go on forever. Like one of these pathways can go on forever. And if there doesn't exist an accepting pathway like this in the execution, your computation can never end, right? <laughs> so it's not like, like again, like I said, in this context, because we have a finite length input, a finite number of states, you can realize this on an actual computer. But, but the thing is, it gets a little weird when you have many, 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 many uh, states. But the thing is, you're allowed to have it where the computations are capable of more than just reading a finite number of symbols and have a finite number of transitions and a finite number, everything's finite, right? <laughs> Um, in the sense that uh, we also don't have anything to remember, right? That's one thing you'll find is a distinguishing thing that separates the regular languages from other languages is the ability to remember where you're currently at beyond just simply current state. Like imagine you could remember actions that happened before that. Like if you had, for example, one intuitive idea is having something akin to stack memory. So for those that might know a little bit about stack memory, you might know about uh, the runtime stack. That's something many computer programs use. Uh, so for example, when you run a computer program, you run and call functions, they go on to a runtime or call stack. So something like that, like that sounds really intuitive to capture much more kinds of computations. And that is in fact true. Uh, you, can, you can come up with things like, this is just a little bit of a spoiler for anybody that's watching this, is that you can and are capable of recognizing more languages than the regular languages in those cases. Uh, but if you go even further, allow yourself to have like randomized memory. Like imagine you have something akin to a RAM. Like something where you can read and write. Read and write. Um, arbitrarily. Uh, that's where you get something called a Turing machine, for example. It's something akin to this, where you can read in both directions. Uh, in that case, you can think about non-determinism as well. And in those cases, you can create computations like this, where the tree is actually infinite in its size. So while I make it sound like it's a like pure, like you, you could imagine something like this on a computer. In fact, this is how you would simulate this. Um, this is one way of doing it. Otherwise you would just simply apply the definition quite literally and you would keep track of those states in some data structure. Uh, but the main point I'm getting at is non-determinism is some wacky stuff because it, sa it says that you're allowed to select, if the machine can select a set of states, that it could be in on each transition. If it accepts, it can select a pathway that gets you there. That's what non-determinism is in another context. So if the machine can follow a pathway to an accepting state, it will. It could perfectly guess the execution that gets you to here. And again, like I said at the beginning of this lecture, that's like magic, right? It can't know the future unless you did it first, like you did it once before, right? Uh, but that's is something that a non-deterministic machine is capable of doing. And it's the exact same intuition as what we were talking about, these threads and stuff. Uh, if you had that capability, then you have this capability. Um, only in the sense as follows, that you know you can brute force all of the options, well, examining one of the pathways is akin to this in the sense that the length of this path of execution is along one of the pathways in such a brute search. Or imagine you brute force all of the possibilities. This pathway is one of them. And since the NFA's execution is, these are all happening simultaneously, right? The difference between these, doesn't, it doesn't matter, uh, at least from a, a theory state standpoint. But the intuition for this is something that comes up quite often in theory of computation as a concept called verification. So you can imagine somebody gives you an, an answer to a question and you can imagine it like checking that answer or verifying it is like one of these pathways. But I'm not going to be talking so much about that here today. That's a whole other topic. <laughs> but are there any questions or anything else that's fun out there in the world? This is just a, another fun aside. I just really want to hammer in the idea that non, the, the fact that these are two are equivalent isn't, isn't, I don't 
consider it obvious, at least for someone that's not familiar with this stuff. I think it's a rather fascinating concept that, that oh yeah, look, the, the NFA's, like, non-determinism here doesn't actually give us anything new. Right, Miss Kitty? Miss Kitty's dancing. I'm just having a nice walk. Oh, awesome. Having a nice walk. <laughs> it's it's getting a bit late there. Yeah, no. At least, uh, at least is the weather nice there? I have to watch this cat. Miss Kitty was jumping over on my production table. <laughs> I'm going to have to have a good... I'm going to have to have a talk with her because she's get, getting a little too close for comfort near my computer. <laughs> All we need is her walking on that sucker and then like, I don't know, the computer blows up or something. Okay, okay. But yeah, no, um, if you haven't yet, uh, so for those that are checking out the chat, uh, do check out uh, Tor Aspiorn's Twitch channel. He actually does pretty good gaming stuff, so check it out. I was actually watching him do some pretty cool Mega Man 9 speedrunning. <laughs> um, I do recommend checking him out. <laughs> but since there aren't any questions or anything like that, I'm going to be actually be heading on out. And I want to say thank you so much for everybody coming on out and enjoying the fun. Thanks, Tor, for the, for the fun comments today. And Miss Kitty, for all the chaos that you cause. Yeah. Yeah, we know about it. Right, Miss Kitty? What is this? <laughs> she just about fell. <laughs> that wasn't that. Hey, why are you attacking me? What, what did I do? <laughs> what did I do, Miss Kitty? I don't know what I did, Miss Kitty. Please tell me the answer. <laughs> but no, but anyways, if you want to get access to the notes after the lecture, I'll be making them available later today on Patreon and Subscribestar. So check out on patreon.com slash pagewizard. Uh, do subscribe. There's all sorts of rewards. Do check it out. And of course, subscribe and follow on all the social media platforms. I have all sorts of updates. And remember, if you have not yet, check out the, uh, the, the, uh, the questionnaire. Let me know when you're best available. That way it can help me know what to, uh, what, what times work best for you so that when we do this together that uh, that you can join the fun. And I want to make sure as many people can join the fun as we can. Sorry, I'm getting really excited. We went through quite a few things here today. So that being said, I want to say thank you so much for coming and joining the fun. I'll be back on Thursday with a gaming stream. So like I said, I'll say thank you so much and have a beautiful day. I'll see you later. <laughs>